All right. So in anticipating perhaps that in Thursday's class, we will be very short on time by the time we get to the idea of the pointing vector, I'm making this video so you have some basic background um, to go along with your reading. So this right here is my attempt of drawing an electromagnetic wave traveling through space. So of course C would be the direction that it's moving in. And keeping in mind then the electric field and magnetic field would be perpendicular to each other. So this um, would be like the electric field, which I drew in pink, would be on, if this is the x-axis, would be on the y-x plane. So this is supposed to be one plane here that would correspond to the screen. While the blue, which represents the magnetic field, would be in a plane that would be coming out of the screen, which would represent the z-axis. And so I tried to draw that three-dimensional situation here on the screen. It was marginally successful. But hopefully you remember these pictures from the book. Keeping in mind, or just reminding you, that both these electric fields and the magnetic field are sinusoidal, so they're varying with time. These expressions should look somewhat familiar because they are related to waves, traveling waves, which we studied at the very beginning of the semester. So in some respects, we're circling back to the material that we saw at the beginning of the semester. So pointing vector, why do I wanna talk about the pointing vector? Well, um, the pointing vector is important in certain applications because when we talk about electromagnetic waves, which are light, so sometimes I'll say light because electromagnetic waves is a lot to say. But anyway, as they travel through space, they're carrying energy. And that energy is contained in both the electric field and the magnetic field. Um, we might talk about energy density which we have encountered in previous chapters. Um, maybe in the chapter on capacitance, we may have, may have talked about the energy density because we were talking about how a fully charged capacitor stores energy. And in that situation, the energy is stored in the magnetic, in the electric field. And so for our electromagnetic wave, we would say, well, we have both energy stored in the electric field and in the magnetic field. Right now I'm gonna present it in terms of energy density. Um, the energy stored in the electric field can be written as one half epsilon naught times E squared. And then the energy stored in the magnetic field can be expressed as one half over, well, one over two mu naught B squared. So as I mentioned, we did talk about this uh, energy density in a previous chapter. I don't think we talked about the energy stored in a magnetic field. If we use the relationship that is true for electromagnetic waves, that the ratio of the electric field and the magnetic field are equal to the speed of light, we could actually rearrange this and substitute into this expression in order to find out how we would express the energy density in solely the magnetic field, and we would get this term. So in any case, that sort of gives a little bit of background for what the pointing vector is. Um, but the, the relevant information is the idea that as these waves are traveling through space, they're carrying energy with them, and that energy is stored in those fields that actually the waves are, the waves consist of those fields. Now, we come up with this vector called the pointing vector. And the pointing vector is, I like to describe it as a flux. Um, and I, 
but not like not as much like magnetic flux but an electric flux but sort of like that um, the The flux here we're talking about is sort of like, as this wave is traveling through space, if I imagined a plane that the wave would pass through, the pointing factor would describe the energy that goes through that area per unit time. And so that's why it's a flux. And, you know, so then we could say, well, electric flux and magnetic flux are sort of like that because they are calculating fields passing through an area. But um, this is a little bit of a twist on that, but we're sort of thinking about what is the energy passing through a area in a certain amount of time? And that is going to be quantified by what we call the pointing vector. The way that it's defined is one over mu naught and then E cross B, which if you think about it and you remember from the beginning of the chapter when we first start introducing the um, electromagnetic waves, which are light, we did mention that the direction of propagation is always given by E cross B. So it sort of makes sense that if we're talking about the motion of the energy or how the energy is moving, that it would E cross B absolutely gives that direction. And also talking about the electric field and the mag magnetic field kind of circles back to the idea of the energy density, which of course we could change from energy density to just simply energy. But obviously it would be related to the strength of those electric fields and magnetic fields. So enough justification for this expression. Now, if you think about it, I actually wrote here the expressions for electric field and magnetic field. And if we substituted those in here, we would see that the um, pointing vector would be something that would vary in time. You know, it's not a constant value, but instead it is a value that will wax and wane along with these cosine functions. So because of that, the, you know, an instantaneous value of the pointing vector, that is the value of a pointing vector at a specific time, might not be as useful because of the fact that if we just change the time, we could get a totally different value for the same wave. So what we like to do um, is we like to think about what its average would be. Like what would be just sort of the average value of the amount of energy that's being delivered? Um, before we do that, let's sort of write a scalar quantity or a scalar amount for the pointing vector. Like just how big is it if I substituted these expressions in for E and B? I could write it if I, again, use this relationship here between the electric field and the magnetic field, I could express this just in terms of one of the fields. For now, we'll do electric field. We could say that the value of the pointing vector could be written as speed of light times epsilon naught times E naught squared times the cosine squared of kx minus omega t. But what we would really like is, what is its average value? Now this quantity here, we call the intensity. Intensity and the average value for the pointing vector are exactly the same thing. That it's just sometimes you'll be told the intensity is this, and you have to remember that that actually means the average value for the pointing vector. So if you think about the cosine squared function, you know, the cosine function in general looks like this, right? Varies between plus one and minus one. If we square it, what happens is that it always is positive. 
So it'll, now it'll only vary between zero and one. And that might make it more helpful to think about if we looked over one complete period of the wave, what would be this average value? And hopefully it makes sense to you that it would be equal to one half. And so if we think about taking all this, but looking at its average value in, you know, over one period, we would say that it's going to just be one half C epsilon naught E naught squared, which could also be written in terms of a magnetic field. And in that case, it would be C over two mu naught B naught squared. When we talk about intensity, it is still going to represent the energy passing through an area per unit time. But the intensity is just more over sort of taking away the fact that these waves are constantly changing and sort of looking like, well, as an average over time, this would be how much energy we would be seeing. And um, that's what we did here by letting the cosine squared that average value being one half. And so this just gives us a single value. This gives us a nice idea given um, a light source, for instance, we could think about if it has a particular intensity at its uh, emission. We could also then think about how that's going to decrease as the light travels outward because you would be having the same amount of energy, but now you're spreading it over a larger area and thinking about what effect that would have. And also, this relationship would also allow you to figure out, you know, sort of the strength of the electric field and the magnetic field in terms of the, the um, amplitude, because those E naughts and B naughts are those amplitudes. So hopefully this is some of the more helpful pieces of information about the pointing vector. Like I said, I'm not sure how much we'll get to talk about it in class, but at least this will give you a little bit something to look at alongside of your reading.